So let's go ahead and get started. Well, um, first of all, thanks for that introduction, Emma. And today I'll just be talking a little bit about uh, climate change and its ecological impacts and uh, specifically later how it pertains to my research during my master's and PhD at Oklahoma State University. Um, first of all, I just want to highlight the extreme climatic events. So with the onset of climate change, we're expected to see an increase in the frequency, intensity, and potentially duration of extreme climatic events. So things like tornadoes, floods, droughts, hurricanes, um, and today I'll be specifically focusing <clears throat> on droughts. Um, and one reason, especially in ecology, that we tend to focus on these climatic events um, is that our study organisms are far more responsive and sensitive to these abrupt changes rather than these long-term drawn out gradual changes. Um, and another reason that, especially in, in graduate school and in academia, we tend to focus on, on these short-term snapshots is, is due to funding or the, the time that a graduate student's allowed to, to research their project when you've only got between maybe one and four years of, of time to, to compile that data. And so, so those are a few of the reasons that, that in ecology we tend to focus on these, um, these intense events rather than um, those longer available data sets when they are there. So from now I'll just kind of run through a, a few of the taxa and organisms that are that are impacted by climate change and um, some of the some of the ways that that happens. Um, so starting with insects, increased temperatures often speed up metabolic processes and other physiological processes, and that can have um, devastating impacts on on plant communities too because as the as the metabolism of insects speeds up, they're consuming more plant material and um, has been linked to lots of pest outbreaks um, around the world. Um, tying into that, we see reduced overwintering mortality risks. Good examples of that are the pine beetles in, in the West where um, historically winters would have killed off a majority of the adult population. Um, but in recent decades, a lot of those adults are surviving through the winter, um, causing the the next year to start with a much higher population than what would have been. We see altered species distributions either um, moving up in latitude or altitude um, with the onset of climate change. And one common theme you'll see throughout my talk with, with uh, the various organisms are altered phenologies. And for those of you that might not be familiar with that um, term, it's just the timing of life cycle events. So things like germination for plants or senescence for plants um, and maybe breeding in, in other organisms and um, migration. And if, if you notice, uh, most of my pictures that I have are of milkweeds because I'm, for my dissertation, I'm studying milkweeds and the effects of drought on milkweeds. So um, I hope you guys do enjoy the pictures. And then um, indirect effects on insects can be seen through changes in plant chemistry, plant toxins. Um, for example, with milkweeds, uh, we know that stressed milkweed plants produce a greater amount of the toxins um, that render them unpalatable to most insect herbivores. And so under a drought stressed plant, um, uh, even, even animals that are, are adapted that have evolved to deal with these toxins like monarch caterpillars can succumb to those, those toxins in drought stress conditions. Um, moving on to climate and birds. So again, changing distributions um, and, change, and these altered precipitation regimes affecting breeding. Um, and here the phenological changes um, mostly occur during migration. And this can cause a what we know, uh, what we know as a phenological mismatch. So potentially, these birds are showing up maybe later, and they're missing maybe peak hatch of a of a crucial insect or uh, insect species that that serve as a mainstay of a food source. And then uh, also, this this might seem a little out of place, but I promise it has a purpose. Um, I study soil microbial communities and how they relate to plants um, and plant health. And soil microbial communities, I 
I can't stress enough how important they are for plant community structure and function and individual plant health. So in these pictures off to the right, these are, um, these are some microscope pictures that I've taken and those these are plant roots and those really dark kind of veiny structures weaving in and out of the roots are the mycorrhizal fungi that are exploring the soil outside of the plant roots and they're bringing nutrients to the plant and in return the plants giving carbon to the to the fungi so it's a it's a nice little mutualism that's that's well studied and easily studied and upwards of 80 percent of earth's terrestrial flora form some semblance of a relationship with these fungi they're they're ubiquitous and abundant and uh, climate change and specifically intense drought have been shown to desiccate these fungal structures um, which has indirect plants indirect consequences for plant health and that move, that takes us to the effects of climate on plant communities. So again, specifically here talking about drought because that's what I'm the most that's what I'm most familiar with. Uh, these decreases in soil moisture impact abundances and distributions of certain plant species. Um, and another thing that I'll kind of stress throughout the talk is that these plants, these fungi, all these organisms are not existing within a vacuum. And that's something we often lose sight of in ecology is that all of these um, organisms are interacting with one another. So one, an impact um, of climate change or drought um, or any other kind of stressor on one organism is gonna have cascading in effects on um, other organisms that are dependent on that organism. And so these, these alterations in plant community um, composition and abundance um, often benefit uh, deep-rooted perennial species and um, inhibit uh, the abundance or decrease the abundance of short-lived perennials or annuals. So um, we often see an increase in canopy cover of already dominant species with the onset of drought and uh, kind of a blinking out of of some of those subdominants. Um, with, with these future um, climate projections, we're also expecting to see greater shrub expansion into grasslands. And something I'll get into a little later, but grasslands are um, not only the most widespread of our terrestrial biomes, but also considered to be the most threatened. And part of that is due to woody encroachment, and that's especially evident here in the Great Plains. Um, we also see altered disturbance regimes, and um, I'm primarily talking about fire frequency and intensity here. Um, it's just look at recent decades in, um, in the Intermountain West and in California where fire frequency has increased um, dramatically. So that kind of brings me to my first uh, case study, if you will, and this is uh, part of my master's research from um, Oklahoma State University, where I was looking at the effects of drought on native and invasive prairie grasses and kind of comparing their performance between the two. So as I mentioned earlier, grasslands make up about 40% of Earth's terrestrial service, surface, and they provide us with countless ecosystem goods and services that we benefit from every day, but may not be taking the time to, to think about. So nutrient cycling and soil stabilization and aquifer recharge and um, a couple others, wildlife habitat, and as a result, ecotourism um, are just some of the things that grasslands offer that, that we benefit from. Um, but sadly, again, um, Grasslands are also considered to be the most threatened of Earth's terrestrial biomes. And um, again, especially evident here in the tall and mixed grass prairies of the central and southern United States, uh, most estimates suggest that only about 1% of the historic tall grass prairie remains. Um, and much of that, as you have as you can probably guess, is due to conversion to row crop agriculture. Um, when we look in the Midwest and states like Iowa, Illinois, um, even Kansas, Missouri, and Oklahoma, um, <clears throat> and we see fragmentation and urbanization. Um, but what I wanna highlight is invasion by non-native species and climate variability. Um, and again, these impacts are not only happening on the plant level, but also on the, all the organisms that may depend on these species, especially those 
um, key symbionts, which are the, which what I study are the mycorrhizal fungi. And one thing I do want to highlight, I've already kind of covered these um, as much as I want to, but in the Southern Great Plains in most of Kansas and Oklahoma and Texas especially, we have a dominance of C4 or warm season perennial grasses. And the vast majority of these grasses cannot complete their life cycle without uh, this association with mycorrhizal fungi. Uh, mycorrhizal fungi, the primary nutrient that they're uptaking is phosphorus and um, reproduction in perennial grasses is extremely phosphorus um, limited and phosphorus um, demanding. So these plants often don't reach reproductive maturity without this symbiosis. Um, and then moving on to, to drought and grasslands. Inherently, grassland, <clears throat> grassland plant species, especially these long-lived perennials, are resilient to drought, but often not resistant. Um, so they're, they, might, um, they might be impacted for one or two or three growing seasons, but, but will regularly bounce back. But that does cause um, issues with short-term short -term vulnerability for a lot of these species. Um, during the onset or within the onset of um, extreme drought, we see reductions in productivity and um, again, those alterations to species composition, which really shake up things um, in the ecosystem on, on almost all trophic levels. And I will say that um, the intensity and the magnitude of the impacts of drought on a, on a grassland um, are largely dependent on what the conditions were like prior to the drought, um, the intensity of said drought, and the diversity of that plant community. Um, as, as more and more literature and more and more research comes out, resiliency within an ecosystem is strongly tied to the, to the diversity of the plant community within that ecosystem. So I just want to um, kind of show, show a little bit of a, a case study from the literature that does that does um, us, that does examine um, temperatures of kind of different from what I've been talking about and what I will be talking about. But on the Colorado Plateau, so this is mainly short grass prairie moving into pinyon juniper woodlands. Um, there's a pretty good study by Min Munson et al. Um, that that had did have some long term temperature data. So here you can see those increases in mean annual temperature from 1989 to 2008, um, although there was an actual decrease from 03 to 08. Um, so what did they find in response to these um, alterations in temperatures? Well, firstly, they found that in the grasslands, we saw, they saw a decrease of cool season, <clears throat> or C3, and an increase in C4 grass cover. Excuse me. And that, that makes total sense as C4 grasses <clears throat> are far more tolerant of drought and elevated temperatures and just a lot more efficient um, physiologically in that way. <clears throat> oh, excuse me. Um, in the shrubland communities, they typically saw remain unchanged. And in those higher elevation woodlands, um, researchers noticed an increase in juniper canopy cover um, to the detriment of of the pinyon pines and ponderosa pines with these increasing temperatures. So again, just kind of showcases that shift in plant community that can occur. So in my study, I was assessing the effects of reduced soil moistures and elevated temperatures on paired native and invasive C3 and C4 prairie grasses. Um, and invasive species have <clears throat> gotten, have gained a lot of attention over the last probably two decades in, in the context of climate change because invasive species often possess um, some physiological adaptations that allow them to be better suited for, for drought and for, for these abrupt changes that, that make them competitively superior to native species. And um, the second objective of this study was to assess the effects of the reduced soil moistures and elevated temperatures on the soil fungal communities associated with these plants. Um, so again, these are the, this is the 
mycorrhizal fungi or AM fungi that I was talking about earlier. Okay, so first I was, and again, I was looking at um, different um, ontogenies. Um, so starting with germination and moving up through mature plants. So that's what I'll walk you through really quickly. So again, this is part of my master's at OSU and along the x-axis, we have field capacity. So that's a metric of soil moisture and along the y-axis percent germination. The dark bars are the invasive species. The light bars are the native species and the left-hand panel are ambient temperatures. The right-hand panel are elevated temperatures. And the big takeaway um, from this figure is that the non-native species always displayed enhanced and increased germination relative um, to the native species. So from the get-go at the seed level, um, there's already some sort of advantage that's being created by the invasive species. And these are the C3 grasses with the graphs oriented much in the same way. Um, and again, uh, very dramatic uh, differences in the non-native and the native grass species in terms of their ability to germinate under, under these um, conditions. So now moving on to seedling biomass, and I apologize that these figures are so blurry, um, but I had to pull these straight from the PDF. I couldn't find the actual PowerPoint figures. So this is seedling biomass of those same species uh, with the graphs oriented similarly. Um, and again, the, the seedlings of the invasive species produced much, much, much greater biomass um, than their native counterparts. And um, it appears that drought isn't having just super devastating effects if you look at um, each species by itself, although the, the effects of the drought are more noticeable in the invasive species, but they just start out producing so much more biomass that um, they would still be out competing the natives in this system. And um, similar results for our C3 species. Now again, or now these these are established plants, so reproductively mature plants that I collected from the field, and um, those those pretty level that level orientation of the bar um, just kind of showcases again that the um, soil moisture really isn't having just a dramatic effect on on either of these species, but the the natives just produce such um, produce much less biomass. And the C3s uh, is a little, little more all over the place with um, the overall advantage um, in favor of the invasives, but suggests that um, coexistence would be more likely in C3 plants under, or in C3 grasses under these conditions. And now looking at the AM fungal community, <clears throat> and in both suites, um, the non-native species was actually associated with greater abundances of AM fungi, which may suggest that it's the fungi are uh, kind of providing a means to allow these plants to preempt resources from the natives. If they're, if they're germinating um, maybe more quickly and are able to establish more quickly, they'll be able to pull up a lot more of the phosphorus and the nitrogen and the soil moisture with the aid of these fungi um, relative to these native species. Um, so in conclusion, just real briefly, the non-native grasses appear to be, um, I wouldn't, I guess, maybe not more tolerant of severe drought, but because they produce a lot more biomass, then there's more of a buffer for them. And they continue to display greater fungal associations, which could potentially be a mechanism um, for that drought resistance or tolerance. So now moving on to my, my second study, and this is um, again part of my master's work. So drought and plant soil feedbacks. For those of you, you've all probably heard the words plant, soil, and feedback, but maybe not all strung together like this. So um, the idea of plant soil feedbacks, um, this arose in probably the late 90s um, that again, plants aren't existing inside of a vacuum. They're constantly interacting with soils around them, with the environment around them, um, and much of this is due, is in the form of root exudate. So um, roots in the soil aren't just um, stagnant and 
static. They're they're pretty dynamic too. They're they're releasing phytohormones that are attracting microbial communities. They're releasing allelopathic compounds that are inhibiting or promoting the growth of other species or themselves. Um, so I like to think of it as sort of a maybe a chemical warfare happening underground with these allelopathic compounds. Um, but in the most basic sense of the war, the term, uh, plants will plants are um, modifying and affecting their soil, the soil conditions around them, and in turn, those soil conditions can dictate whether that plant species will continue to persist or establish or or not. And so that's kind of the idea of plant soil feedback is that reciprocal effect. And this is a um, diagram from that first plant soil feedback paper that that models that. Um, so plant soil feedback they they strongly influence plant community structure and function and species arrangement on the landscape. And they promote the dominance of some species, especially invasive. So I do wanna highlight without getting too much uh, in the weeds for back, lack of better terms, but um, most native plant species are creating negative plant soil feedbacks, which it sounds like a bad thing, but it's actually promoting um, heterogeneity and biodiversity. So in a negative feedback, a plant's maybe accumulating pathogens that are host specific and the majority plant can su survive there, but the seedlings might not be able to um, because they would succumb to those, those pathogens. Um, so that promotes coexistence and heterogeneity, um, but non-native species, invasive species are creating these positive plant soil feedbacks through sometimes allelopathic compounds that, that inhibit the growth of anything else but itself. And so that's what this study is trying to tease apart is um, the effects of drought on the plant soil feedbacks um, occurring between native and invasive species. And um, again, these figures, they're, they might get kind of messy, but I'll do my best to walk you through them in a, in a succinct way. Um, so this is just a diagram. So if you focus on the top bar, um, the left-hand side are, are plants that were grown under ambient temperatures, and the right-hand side are plants that were grown under elevated temperatures. So the dark green grasses are native, the yellowish ones are invasive, and so we grew these plants, and these are, this is actually the experiment that I was referencing in, in the previous section, but we took the soil microbial communities that were conditioned by these plants and added them in this fully reciprocal um, feedback study to where each combination of drought and temperature and species um, in, in the new study was inoculated by these co um, communities from the previous study. And it kind of gives us an idea of, of the legacy of the soils on the plant community. So these, these figures, there's, there's four panels for, for each one. And really the big takeaway here that I want you to see is that um, if you look along the x-axis, Escoparium is the native species, B. Ishimum is the invasive. And, um, but both species seem to do better in soil um, conditioned by the invasive species, which is indicated by the dark bar, which is, which is interesting. Um, and now for the cool season species, really not much of a difference here, um, suggesting that coexistence is, is probably likely for these species, but not so much for the warm seasons on the left. And um, again, there's a lot here that I'm not covering, but what I really want to focus on are these figures. So these are the feedbacks um, of those figures that we just saw. So the left is warm season and the right is cool season. And anytime that bar is below zero, that's a negative plant soil feedback suggesting coexistence. Um, anytime that's above, that suggests um, a positive plant soil feedback or competitive exclusion by the invasive species. And so what, what does this mean? What did these bars mean without um, getting too much into it, but these bars show um, that when conditions are similar from, from 
T1 to T2. So T1 would be that initial study. Um, T2 would be this subsequent study. The negative plant soil feedbacks are generated suggesting coexistence. So when, when conditions are similar from, let's say, year to year, coexistence is promoted. However, when these positive plant soil feedbacks appear to be detected when conditions shift rapidly from time step one to time step two or uh, T1 to T2. So with that, we, we can assume that rapidly changing conditions um, really give the advantage to the invasive species, which is interesting. I know that was a, a lot to take in and I wish I had more time to get into it, but I really want to get to this final section, which is what I'm working on for my PhD with um, partial funding from CASC, as Emma said earlier. And this is the effect of drought on wildflowers, and this has tremendous implications for, for pollinator conservation. Uh, so the impact of climate change on flowering plants, as I mentioned earlier, is mainly going to be in the form of altered phenologies, um, but also reduced productivity and floral resources. So think nectar and pollen, and um, the, the resources that pollinators are are, at, are really after, and altered anti-herbivore defenses, um, which are those, those defenses, sometimes those secondary metabolites that plants are producing to ward off would-be herbivores. And these changes are, are going to have multi-trophic consequences, which uh, with those phenologies resulting in mismatches for the pollinator. So if a flower, if a plant's flowering earlier in the season, um, but that that moth is emerging from its cocoon at the same time of the year uh, or at the same time as it did the previous year, um, then that moth won't, won't be there to pollinate that flower. Um, and the reduced floral resources lead to disrupted pollinator interactions and the altered defenses may disrupt tightly linked symbiosis. So, I was mentioning earlier with milkweeds, they're producing sometimes greater cardinalides, which are the toxic um, glycosides that monarchs are sequestering. Um, so they're, they're producing more of those under drought and sometimes these caterpillars, these monarch larvae, um, can't withstand that level of those toxins. So the objectives of this study were to assess productivity, um, flora resources, defense mechanisms, and AM fungal communities within these, um, associated with these, these wildflowers. And I uh, just wanted to show you some, some nice pictures of, of the plant species in this study. So this, in the, we'll start in the top left. This is Salvia azuria, or pitcher sage, um, common throughout the south and central Great Plains. In the middle, you might recognize this one. This is butterfly milkweed, um, again common in the tall grass prairie and mixed grass prairie. Um, this purple one on the top right is a wild petunia. Bottom left is um, green antelope horn, another one of our common milkweeds, and then the aptly named common milkweed on the bottom right. And I tried to uh, make uh, or choose a picture each of these plants showing it's maybe one of its respective pollinators with um, bumblebees and some sweat bees and um, maybe not a pollinator but on the bottom left you can actually see a handful of monarch caterpillars on that milkweed. So total biomass production between these species again along the x-axis we have species along the y-axis we have plant biomass. The dark bars are droughted and the light bars are well watered. And these plants, I didn't drought them in the first year as seedlings because um, it takes a while for these perennial plants to accumulate biomass. So these were all maintained under uh, well watered conditions for a year before, uh, before being droughted the following year. And three of the five species did exhibit se severe decreases in biomass production in response to drought. And the two that didn't um, produce these really thick tuberous um, tap roots that uh, probably reserved enough, enough energy for them to, to continue growing under drought conditions. Now for reproductive biomass on the left-hand side, um, what we're looking at 
are the three species that did produce reproductive biomass or did flower during the drought. And of those species, the only one we could um, really conduct an analysis on was this hairy wild petunia or Ruellia humilis, um, which produced much greater reproductive biomass under well watered conditions. And then taking that a step further and looking at the nectar produced by this species, it produced um, significantly greater nectar under well watered conditions, which um, makes sense with, with a um, watery fluid being kind of the carrier for the sugar, sugar in nectar. Um, and now moving on to plant defenses. So milkweeds, they produce a plethora of anti-herbivore defenses. Um, some of us are familiar with their latex, which um, gives them their namesake milkweed. Um, so on the left-hand side are our two latex producing milkweeds, um, common milkweed and green antelope corn. And both of them produce significantly greater latex under uh, well-watered conditions. And again, latex, um, a major constituent of latex is water, um, so it makes sense that these plants would produce greater latex. And then we didn't see differences in trichomes. So trichomes, if you're not familiar, are these um, tiny little irritating hairs on the leaf surface that make it hard for, for herbivores to chew up, and they're just kind of really irritating on, on the mouth parts. Um, but those did not change in response to drought. And then AM fungal communities, these are two different metrics of AM fungal community measurement. And on the left-hand side, that's the amount, the abundance inside the root, which didn't change for any species. And we did see some changes in, um, on the right-hand side, which is, which is abundance of, of AM fungi or mycorrhizae in the soil surrounding the plant roots. So, under drought, we do see instances, but again, these it looks like these are these responses are largely species specific, and um, that we can't really paint every plant with a broad broad brush here in in assessing their responses. So, in conclusion, I um, just want to highlight that drought reduces productivity and reproductive capabilities of these wildflowers, and may reduce nectar production, um, and it. And drought can impact the production of these anti-herbivore defenses, but the responses appear to be um, uh, largely driven by which, which defense it is. And the impacts on the soil microbial communities um, appear to depend on host plant identity. And so I guess the take home message from this, this, the entirety of this talk is that climate change typically affects organisms um, directly and indirectly through these extreme climatic events and that many trophic levels can be impacted. And um, because these organisms aren't operating within a vacuum, there will be indirect consequences for all the organisms that, that depend on or interact with these um, affected organisms. And I uh, just want to end with saying that these relationships are incredibly complex um, with, with the plant soil feedbacks and the the plants and the fungi, and we're really just starting to, to get at the, the impacts of climate and weather patterns on these interactions. And with that, I think that's all I have for you.